The presidential candidate of the African Democratic Congress, ADC, Dume B. Kachiku, has described the victory of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Bola Tinubu, in last Saturday's election as well-deserved. Mr. Kachiku also alleged that all the four major parties, namely the APC, PDP, LP, and NNPP, committed fraud during the election. Bola Tinubu won the poll with 8,794,726 votes, while Atikwa Bubaka of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, came second with 6,984,520 votes. Peter Obi of the Labour Party, third, with 6,101,533 votes. The three candidates won 12 states each. Mr. Kachiku polled 81,919 votes in the election. Well, joining us to discuss the ADC stand on the just concluded elections and plans for the coming governorship elections is the vice presidential candidate of the ADC, Ahmed Buhari. Welcome to the program. Uh, good to be here. Yeah. I, I, I was more comfortable trying to call you Ahmed B. Is that all right? Yeah, uh, for many people who are not comfortable with uh, President Muhammad Buhari, <laughs> we'll just shorten my name to Ahmed B. Uh, we don't want to call Buhari at all. And I say that um, it's a name the way you have, uh, although nobody, many people don't have Nyambo. <laughs> yeah, I find very interesting and yeah. the meaning also makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. above the rest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, um, it's fine to call me Ahmed Buhari. Uh, many people nickname me as Ahmed B. Uh, for the for the purpose of comfort, it doesn't matter. No, no. The reason to call uh, calling you Ahmed B was not because it sounded Buhari. No, Buhari is a good name, isn't it? it is. uh, so, so Ahmed B has a ring to it. Like you're more friendly. You're very close to the people. Right. You have a nickname I can call. I, I don't know the nickname of President Buhari, for instance. Uh, Baba. Baba. <laughs> <laughs> Well, congratulations on your bold uh, outing in the last election. Yes, it, thank it was you very really much. good. Yeah. Well, you are you were inspired by uh, political happenings around the world. From what I, I saw about you, uh, what is happening in France and other countries where young people are thrown up, they are now on the throne, as it were. And you came back to Nigeria here. How, how would you how would you see um, the political landscape in Nigeria? Do you think we have we have reached that point where people who aspire like you, young people who are coming to the hem of affairs, can have that kind of chance that we are seeing in other countries? I think it's a process. I think uh, compared to 30 years ago, I can still remember exactly what the political terrain seemed like. You only need to make a declaration and get killed the next day, maybe. Um, your family could be kidnapped. Um, you could just hear people say they're pulling out of the race because uh, certain things have some certain threats mm -hmm. have been sent to their selves and their families and so if we are in 2023 now and a lot of people are just all in the race regardless of all of those kinds of fears and I think we are actually progressing uh, with regards to my ambition I remember it all started in 2016 when I came out of almost much younger slimmer my beards were still softer and then I say to the whole world that I was going to run for the office of the president. To be honest with you, it was born out of my desire to it happen differently. And I was really upset with the way our so-called leaders were running the affairs of the country. And then I had, uh, I had a business going on and most of the things that we felt the right policies would help us achieve were not being talked about at the helm of affairs. And I said, if the only thing that would achieve would be having healthy conversations that can sort of redirect the narratives around the political elites, then we will do it. We ran for that election, uh, we ran to the end, we did well, I'm, great, I'm happy we did well. And then in 2019, in, 20, in the build-up of 2023, I got calls from different uh, presidential candidates uh, inviting me to be a running mate. And I said, oh, wow, so we did, did something mm -hmm. in the last election. Eventually, I decided to settle with um, the baby Kachiku. And um, it's, um, it's interesting that we came fifth after the big four. Mm, okay, that's very interesting. Uh, but uh, did you settle with Dumebi Kachiku because of his person or what the party had to offer? So I listened to all of the um, candidates that invited me for this conversation to be a running mate. And I sort of warmed up to Dumebi more. I think there was this, this lot of passion and desire to see something happen differently. From the beginning of the collaboration, all of that was vibing. Uh, unfortunately, we were dealing in, with a party that also had a different agenda. And so while we were thinking of getting to the polls, the party was thinking of who, to, who they were going to eventually deal with. 
uh, when it comes to deal with, I'm talking about negotiate with and make some money. This is what the party has always done. And that really gave us a huge setback. Hmm. That's very interesting. So, um, uh, you're, what are we expecting from Ahmed? So, so um, From you uh, as a person? My principal and I did make um, very, very um, clear comments about our future. And it's going to be service to humanity, service to the nation, you know, having conversations that would help direct a generation of people who I believe would, without any, um, uh, without um, trying to belittle anybody, we have a problem with processing information. And so who, it depends on who is saying it. We just take it to town without necessarily breaking it down to understand it and know how well to use it, if we should, why we should, and how we should use such information. And I think uh, we are committed to working with the rest of the country to ensure that these things have been addressed. Necessarily as political office holders or as individuals? Um, you know, like I told, like I said to everybody, I, I didn't plan to be in the race in 2023, you know, but in my bed while I slept, I got this course. And so um, we will see how it goes. Okay, so what's your general assessment of the just concluded elections? Uh, we've, we just uh, talked about your principal saying that uh, every party rigged it, uh, but um, maybe we'll, we'll just hear your he own side said, of the story. He also said that. This is a lesson to religious leaders who use the pulpit as a, as a space for political discussions. And I think he is spot on on all of those things. I think um, Nigerians have never been divided like we are right now on political matters because we allowed religion and ethnicity play a major role in the decisions that we made through the process. And I think it's extremely wrong. I think, um, like I said, the generation must be focused on the kind of information that we receive, be, decipher it properly so that we know the kind of um, so that we know the next moves to make. Um, with regards to the rigging, um, I, I just sort of, sort of um, randomly stumbled upon a 1979 video uh, when NPN won the election in, two, uh, in um, 1979. Um, it was um, Sheo Shagari that emerged as the president. And there were three other parties who lost, mm. and they came together to announce that they were not going to accept the result and they were going to go to court, and it was rigged, it was massive rigging. But I'll tell you something, every single space you find people who, that where, where, where people control, they always rig. The results that came out from the Southeast is something you don't want to look at twice. It's like 97%, yeah? With, with in a space where you have other parties, people said people were chased out of the queues, People were driven away except they were going to vote for certain parties. The same thing happened in Lagos because the, the Lagosians felt this was their space. The area boys came in and tried to, you know, bombard everybody. If you say these things happen in Kano, I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue. We saw young children voting in Kano. Mm. Same, similarly, we saw young children voting in the Southeast. So generally, our election pattern has always been heavily uh, misguided and controlled by, you know, whoever takes hold of the space. I think that what Kachiku was just trying to say was the election was between a formidable APC and a divided PDP. Everybody on the other side used to be part of the PDP. Kwankwasu was part of the PDP. Atiku Abakar was part of the PDP. Peter was part of the PDP. When they pulled out, divided themselves, there was no way they could actually have beaten um, Tinubu. Tinubu might not be liked by certain people in certain age categories and social status, but you go to other places, he's been celebrated. He's, been, he's loved by a lot of people in the North. He started his campaign by, first of all, you know, clearing out the whole Muslim-Muslim ticket with um, Khan and some other top Christian bodies that were against the Muslim-Muslim ticket, and they never said anything about Muslim-Muslim ticket again. And then the next stage was, let me campaign from where I'm the weakest. And he started campaigning from Northern Nigeria, introduced himself to them, picked some of their strong stakeholders, and before you know it, he was an accepted figure. Before you know it, they not give him the vote. If you look at the vote pattern, in 2019, APC made 15.7 million votes. In 2023, they're making 8.7, they lost 7 million votes. That means a lot of people were not happy with the APC. However, because the divided PDP had gone in separate ways, they were unable to put those numbers that would have given them about 14, 15 million votes to defeat the APC. Okay, uh, well, um, you did well in the last election. You came fifth, like you said. Uh, what are we looking at for governorship? Um, what prospects do you think that the ADC has in governorship? We have a fantastic um, candidate 
in Lagos, uh, French Doherty, well spoken, highly educated, an excellent gentleman. But you know, I'm in Lagos to support the process, but um, I haven't quite seen the euphoria around his person. You know, the euphoria is largely around the existing um, APC governor, the Labour Party um, gubernatorial candidates, and obviously the PDP gubernatorial candidate. They seem to be the top three that everybody seems to be talking about. And when I look at all of them here, yeah, I'm thinking in my head, what makes them, what makes in one of them different from the rest, you know, and, you know, try to understand where we're headed. Are they all the same? Are they different? And if you look at it critically, uh, Sean Wolu, I've always said it, he's a product of the Lagos Godfather, <laughs> yeah. Godfather system. Except you are anointed, you cannot become. And so, I mean, that for me is something I want to stop. I, I love and respect mentorship. When you bring Godfatherism into it, do I have to call you to tell you before I make a decision after you have actually taught me what to do in the years past? So I, I, I don't want that to continue in Lagos. The, other, the, uh, the next candidate, who's the Labour Party candidate, who used to be in PDP, uh, lost the primaries in PDP, and he was asked to move to the uh, Labour Party by um, Bode George, and then he went to the Labour Party at the time when I think they had this um, chaos between another candidate who said he won the primary, so he was the, he was the bona fide guy, and I think the case is still in court, at uh, the Supreme Court or so. That's a different matter. But I think what is most important here is, now that he's in the Labour Party, I am seeing a Bode George who is a chieftain in the PDP, mm. saying, yeah, that's my boy, that's the one I support. And I'm telling to my, saying to myself, somebody calls Lagosians, <laughs> or why would, we have, why would we move from one godfather to another godfather? Because everybody knows in Lagos, Tinubu is the godfather of the APC, or the godfather of Lagos. And, and for, for, time, for, for, the, for the best times I've known, but they just have always also wanted to become the new um, uh, godfather of, um, of Lagos. So it's a, it's a tussle, and then all of them have got the puppets there. And then I looked at the third guy, um, the PDP guy, um, Jando. I remember his biggest, con his biggest um, scene in the PDP was because he didn't listen to Bode George, who wanted him to make Rhodes Vivo, who lost in the primaries to become his um, running, running mate. mate. And he said, no, I'm, I'm not going to choose that as my running mate. I'm going to decide by myself who my running mate is going to be. And that was where they fell out with Bode George. And so Bode just asked the guy to move to Labour while Jando went ahead to pick uh, Funke Kindele as his running mate. For me, that was brave, that was um, strong, and I respect that. It means that we probably might, if we're thinking very deeply, get a governor for Lagos State that is not controlled by any bloc or godfather or persons. Uh, so you think... Um, uh someone can stay in the PDP and not be controlled by Well, we've the seen governance. it. We've seen it because in the PDP, the PDP, original PDP structure, wanted other people, like um, uh, the other Doherty in PDP, to become the uh, gubernatorial candidate. And I remember when he was able to, you know, maneuver his way into the PDP and actually clean the ticket, it made a lot of PDP members really upset that this guy that we do not know this guy that doesn't seem like a guy we can control will not be able to allow us, you know, get the way we want to get it. So <coughs> things like that I respect as a young person. And, I, and I'm hoping that Lagosians see beyond the euphoria of maybe Peter or B, which obviously is what I think Rosvivo is hiding under. The same way uh, uh, Shawn Olu is, um, the euphoria around Shawn Olu is that Tinubu picked him and everybody has to follow. I think these things are very pertinent, and I think Lagosians should, should think deeper. I am from Kontagora, a very small town in Niger State. I lived there for 16 years, yeah? Uh, I don't live here anymore, but anything that concerns Lagos concerns me, because this is the first town that made me the man I became. And it's important for me to pay close attention to the happenings here and render my advice where I think it's necessary. And I think very important to note is they are running mates as well. You know, I, I, I remember when Jado picked Funke again, I felt... That was also very brave. Number one, this, was a, this is a woman, in my opinion, who naturally in, 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 exists in a space where women have to work 10 times harder than men to succeed. And then we're hearing today that she has the highest grossing movie in Nigeria. I mean, that's somebody I respect. That's somebody that's hardworking. And when you look at her antecedents and where she's coming from, based on family background, 
You cannot say she's from a wealthy family. She's not from a blue blood. She's from the ground. And then I, and that, that pushed me to find out more about the Abdulaziz Jando guy. And clearly, this guy used to hawk food for his mom. You know, and then recently I saw his um, wife resort, and everybody was ah, oh, he didn't even do well at all in his resort. He, <laughs> he made some Fs. And, and then I called him, I said, I, I called um, somebody who is in the PDP, and I said, I'm just hearing that your guy did so badly. He said, I spoke to him. He said some of those days he was actually hawking. And sometimes he doesn't even come back home until in the night. Mm. There was no electricity for him to even study. That look, the most important thing for us to note is, despite all of those challenges, he could rise. He could him. rise. He could rise in the private sector. He's been in the public sector. And I think based on his business, an employer of labor, I, I just think there are deeper things to be really um, <laughs> watching out for. OK, there, there are some things that uh, you've just said that I never knew existed, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's leave that now. This is Lagos. Like you said, you have an interest in Lagos. Lagos made you who you are. But whether you have come to Lagos or not, like they always say, is the commercial uh, capital of Nigeria. When Lagos uh, sneezes, the nation catches a cold. That's what they say. True, true. So we need to get it right in Lagos. What are some of the things that you identify in Lagos that need to be addressed? We don't know who is going to be governor, we no matter what we say. But there are things that the next governor needs to look at. We have to decentralize the center. You know, every single activity comes down to Victoria Island, Ikoi, Lekki. And that is because once you go past the Keja, so I came into town on Monday and I've been privileged to move into places like Agege, further into Agege, like places like Gatankoa, into Mushin, down deep into Mushin. Uh, mile 12 and what exists behind my 12, a papa and what exists behind a papa, everything you see is just color. Once you go past the first two streets inward, you will be shocked at the living condition of the so called Lagosians that we think are doing all right mm. in comparison with those that live in all this other half of the city. And my biggest fear and worry is that as much as they keep coming every day into the city to fend for their selves and you know, you know get a daily, daily, their daily bread, the worry of something is that a day will come when they will explode. Nothing exists there. There are no roads, there are no tap water. I'm talking about Lagos that is saying it's making about seven, over 70 billion uh, naira in revenue every month. You need to see a commensurating level of development on ground. It is not happening. It makes me wonder if indeed part of the resources being generated is being diverted somewhere else. But in, 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 all, in all honesty, I think those people living in those areas are the real concern that whoever becomes the next governor should really address. And that is the only way you can get the real progress that you want with regards to the traffic, with regards to um, you know, proper taxation, to avoid multiple taxation, in, with regards to so many other things. I think we should decentralize the center. I think we should be, there should be more focus in those suburbs and make sure that they, they have the basic amenities so that they don't influx the city all the time. They don't need to be here. They only come here because they want to survive. Yeah, but Lagos, uh, Lagos capital is in Ikeja. Yes, go so, past the Keja and see. Mm. I told you, the Keja stops at the Keja. Go past the Keja. Go into, go, I, I don't know if, I know you don't know the place. Go to Gatankoa and see. Well, I've seen all those uh, areas. I, I understand what you're, you're talking about. Um, some, some grows and glows of Lagos is what we're looking at. Some things that we can give them a pat on the back and say, okay, you have done well, but you can do better. But the things that they really need to do, let's say security, let's say education, let's say traffic, let's say health and all that. How would you rate them in various sectors? So again, with, with regards to education, during the last um, debates in Lagos, I listened to the three main guys that presented themselves, Fushun, Fushun Doharty of the ADC, um, the Labour Party candidate, um, Rose Vivo, and um, um, Abdulaziz uh, Adediran Jando of the PDP. And one thing that was very clear in that, in that debate was, when the question of out of school children slash agbiros was asked, um, everybody said some things like, we're going to get them out of the street, we're going to get them jobs. And then when the PDP candidate responded, he responded in, in a way that I didn't expect. He said, I would have conversations with churches and mosques to see how they can use their free hours to accommodate children in those facilities while we start making plans for the long term. So in the short term, we would have children at use the church premises for education. I would get teachers employed to teach them while I get um, 
uh, the same children in some small areas so that they can teach them, teach them. And then as that is all going on, we're now building up. And I, and I felt that was really commendable to involve those, um, those sort of um, bodies to be part of this growth for these people. And I think it's a process. And I think it must be progressive. And I, and I think the other thing I said from the beginning with regards to young people's inability to process information has to do with the fact that when I hear something, I want to ask how. And then I have to put it side by side with the realities on the ground. Is it possible? I live in the city. Can it be done? How do you get agribusiness off the road? Is it by giving them money or taking them where? You can't just get them off. It's a process. These guys have a lot to do. The same way when the Almajiri system was about to be eradicated in northern Nigeria by former president, good luck, Jonathan. I felt it was a great idea. But these guys were taken off the streets and pushed into some dormitories without even a syllabus. Hmm. How do you want to run the space? Fantastic idea, but the how was, was missing. And so after the government went out, nothing could happen in the space. The boys went back to the streets. Unfortunately, a government came in place that didn't even make it an agenda. Sad. It's sad. It's really, really sad. But you just uh, st uh, struck something about continuity. Yes. Because if there had been continuity from that, uh, the next government would have provided at least a syllabus to the people that were dumped somewhere. To be fair to the APC government, there's been a lot of continuity, especially on the federal level, a lot of continuity from the previous administration. We've seen rail, li rail lines completed. We've seen BVN come into fruition. We've seen certain policies and programs that were started by the Jonathan administration and completed by the Buhari administration. We can see implementation and see it working, which means we have to give that to them. You know? However, for the ones that might not have been able to be controlled, probably they didn't have the framework that anybody could use to help continue them. I think all of those things are also things. You think that that's a good issues. enough excuse? It is good enough excuse because if I'm, for example, if I come in and I see that you've started a project and I'm asking for the manual, where's the manual? Where's the um, program design that you use? <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> I'll just sweep it because I cannot understand it. I don't know where it started from. I don't know where it is now and things like that. People, politicians can easily give excuses like that, you know, and that is why it is important for us to put everything in proper perspective. And then people keep saying a lot of things with regards to why the country is not working, is it the right president, does this one say sensational things and all of that. Well, I think what is very important here is the civil service structure. Everything that the, ed the executives and the legislative and the judiciary bring on, on board, the civil service structure is unable to implement simply because the corruption starts and ends there in reality. And which is why I, I keep saying we have to move from a salary incentive system to a welfare incentive system. So that as a civil servant, I know that the day I get into the civil service, I'm, I, I, can, I, can, I can start paying for my rent to own house. Mm. My children can go to school and I'm going to be charged that through my 35 years in service or 60 years, whichever comes first. Um, uh, of course, healthcare, full health cover. Go to the ministries today. You see posters of people, John Shaibu, um, Abraham Lincoln, they're all looking for 200,000, 300,000 for medical care. Mm -hmm. Go back there after one month, obituary, obituary, they're gone. Well, okay. Well, now <laughs> let's go back to politics and youth. Um, we're wrapping up now, so right. let's just take this, maybe a one-off now, and finish. You've become a model to youths who want to go into politics. You've learned some lessons, and a lot of people after the last election may be discouraged. Whether we like it or not, they'll be discouraged. But from what you have seen, and we're hoping you're going to continue being in a political space, no matter how. <laughs> but we're hoping that. So let's, let's just hear you talk to the youths, what the, you think they must do to continue uh, to uh, function in that space, in that political space. Yeah, I, I, think, I think more than anything else, I'm really proud of young people. I've, I've seen them find a voice. Um, they found a voice as a collective. I call us, or call them, I'm older now, I call them. You're a politician. You're, <laughs> even, you're not even up to the age of I'm, a I, youth I, leader. I, I, I call them. I call them the new tribe. I call them the new tribe. I call them the guys that we really need to um, look out for, with especially, especially with how we can free ourselves from these shackles. Mm. But I want us to really um, stop the hate. Um, when somebody tells you something, um, don't just discard it. Listen to it. Hear their points out. They might be right. You might have an, an information that you already have stuck in your brain. And then a new information comes. 
What you're supposed to do is not to discard the old one, but to marry them together and see which is superior. I want us to be a generation of very smart people, not just follow, follow people. Otherwise, we'll get it wrong. Mm -hmm. What a way to wrap it up. We've been talking with the vice presidential candidate of ADC, uh, Ahmed Buhari, and it's been very enlightening and very, very interesting uh, talking with him. We would like to say thank you for coming on the program. Today. But it's good to be in your studio for the first time after, <laughs> after five about five years of conversation. Yeah, it's And so it's nice a beautiful place, bigger mm. than I thought. I thought you were in a corner, but you are in a space. <laughs> Ahmed, thank you so much for coming on thank the program. Thank you. Well, uh, we are going to go on a short break, and when we return, we'll be discussing politics in Ogun State, Nigeria. Stay with us.